Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of Summer Community Days. Uh, we are starting today off with a fireside chat style keynote on diversity and data. Uh, today, I am joined by a lovely panelist of a bunch of awesome data experts. Uh, so thanks in advance to all of them who have given us some of their time to chat through this topic. Um, on stage here shortly, you'll see Julia King, who is the VP of Data and Analytics at Carta, Julie Bainon, who is the head of analytics at Clearbit, Christine Ndege, who is a data engineering consultant and contractor, David Jai Tilliker, head of data at Metaplane, and Jessica Cherney, senior data analyst at Ironclad and also founder of the Data Angels community. Um, the discussion is going to be moderated by Megan Cassidy, who is a lead data analyst at Brooklyn Data Co. Um, so yeah, this is going to be a great discussion. Uh, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, as well as all of our panelists. Um, today, most of the discussion is going to be uh, kind of centered around what modern data companies can do to foster diversity on their teams, why diversity in data is something data teams and companies of all sizes should care about, uh, how a lack of diversity can negatively impact individual practitioner careers, as well as the teams that they're part of, and the role of community in opening up doors for more diverse voices in our industry. Um, throughout the talk, there will be a couple polls that uh, Megan will be kind of walking everybody through. So feel free to find those in the polls uh, section of the chat over on to the right. Um, we'll have about an hour together. Uh, they'll do kind of full intros here in a second for about five or 10 minutes. We'll have a discussion for about 35 or 40 minutes and then some Q&A at the end. Um, as always with all of our uh, sessions as part of Summer Community Days, you can find all of our panelists in the OA Club for any questions, discussion, um, or just general networking after the session. Um, so with that, uh, I will hand the mic over to our lovely panelists and I will see you all at the end. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, let's just dive in and get started um, so we can learn a little bit more about each of you. Uh, what has your experience been with diversity in data, either personally as someone from an underrepresented group or that you've witnessed as a leader or peer on your teams? I will go first. Right. I agree. <laughs> okay. oh, go ahead, Julia. <laughs> no one wants to be the first one. <laughs> no, and it's a little early in the West Coast for some of us. Mm -hmm. But um, hi, everybody. I'm Julia. Um, I work, I've been working in data for a long time. And I think one of the things that I've noticed uh, in data teams and actually a lot of different teams that I actually think they are becoming more diverse than before. When I started out, it was a very male dominated industry. Um, so the, the positive trends are that, that we are seeing a lot more women, like, you know, a lot of my co-panelists here that are stepping into leadership roles and actually jumping into these very technical roles as well, which is amazing to see, but I think we definitely have a lot, a lot, uh, longer road ahead of us to actually make it more diverse than it is today. But, um, I think at least it's trending in a positive direction. Uh, thanks, Julia. Hi, everyone. I'm Christine. I am a data engineer, a consultant data engineer, but I've been in the data space for the last 10 years working for different size companies, uh, global companies, smaller startups uh, in different roles, data engineer, solutions engineer, data analyst. And uh, one thing I do have to say that I absolutely love that there are women in leadership in data today because I will say that is something that I have not had uh, too much experience with uh, in my uh, in my history, um, especially even just going all the way up the chain. I think all the companies I've worked with have been uh, led by male CEOs. But um, yeah, my my experience uh, has been varied. I have had some teams that were a bit more diverse, but it's not very uncommon that I am. Uh, if not like the only woman or the only black woman in the all of data and engineering that has uh, been my experience actually a couple of times. But yeah, no, I'm excited to see the changes that are coming. I've also done analytics on uh, pipelines for hiring specifically for data, which, uh, which look good. But yeah, that is my experience in data. Thank you. I can, I can jump in. Uh, hi, I'm Julie, uh, head of analytics at Clearbit. I would say uh, my experience is quite similar. I think what I found growing up or getting into this space was most of my mentors were men. Um, I didn't really see a me in a leadership position. And I've been fortunate enough to kind of get those opportunities. And one of the things that's super important to me, and I, I've lost my voice, so if I start coughing, I do apologize, um, is that um, I've been able to reach back and in this position is reach back and mentor and and kind of build the diversity from the next generation. And that's something that I'm very passionate about is um, 
giving people the opportunity and giving them someone to look at um, as a mentor that maybe doesn't look like what I had when I was growing up in this space. Um, I can go next. Um, I started my initial career interests in software engineering <laughs> um, and realized that data just suited me more. But before in the software engineering world, I saw that there was a lot less diversity than I personally experienced in the last uh, four to five years in data. Um, so whenever I, going to Julie's point, whenever I reach out to mentors or potential more senior women mentors on LinkedIn or Twitter, um, it's very easy to find women in the space as opposed to um, previously it was much harder and more sparser. Um, so that's kind of just my experience. And even when you go to events and happy hours and even the Slack channel, if you just peruse, it's a lot more diverse <laughs> uh, because there's people coming from all kinds of backgrounds um, as opposed to maybe software engineering, it's um, usually through schooling or boot camps that are more traditional um, in terms of makeup of gender and ethnicity. So um, yeah, it's really refreshing to see. Hi, I'm David. Um, I've been in data for uh, a long time too. <laughs> um, I've led different data teams and uh, I've scaled a data team or two and kind of seen both ends of the diversity spectrum of having quite poor diversity at, at one point and then seeing it progress towards it being much, much better. Um, and it's, you know, it's something that I've, at, at the start of my career, it wasn't something that people really talked about very much, even though it was a more, more acute a problem than, than it is now. And now, you know, at least it's, I think it, we're getting to a point where companies really want to address the problem. And that's like the first, first step of addressing it is wanting to. Yeah, thank you all. Um, I'll share a little bit as well. Um, my career over the past decade and a half inside and outside of data has been in very uh, male dominant spaces um, until I came to Brooklyn Data Co where I'm a lead analyst and our team there and especially our awesome people ops folks are been very intentional about how we do our hiring process. Um, and that's been really um, encouraging to see. Uh, so I'm really grateful to be here and learn about everybody's experience, thoughts, and questions um, around this topic. Um, I'm going to ask a question that I just saw in the chat. Um, what do you all suppose accounts for the lack of diversity in in the field? Well, I'll kind of just give some of my, uh, just from my personal experience. Uh, yeah, I think one of the projects I did for one of my clients, uh, there was a women's group and I looked at some EEO anonymously collected data just to see what the pipeline was for all the different teams. You know, as I think we heard like engineering, the split wasn't great, but I was very surprised that with data, it was almost 50, 50 men and women. And one thing to note, like data is very interesting because almost everyone has like a different background. I don't know anyone who has the same data path. I actually uh, was just working with, uh, you know, a client who was an architect and just switched over to data. So I actually tend to be a bit less forgiving when there is not a very diverse uh, candidate pool. So I think it is um, a couple of things. One, you have to actually have advocates for data. I've seen situations where HR is making an effort, but if you know like the hiring manager doesn't believe in data and it's like i've had cases like hey i'm not biased i just want the best then uh you know that does actually i think to me has been one of like the biggest influences in terms of like if you are going to have a successfully diverse team and i have thing i have to mention too is retention because if uh you know if you're uh if your diverse candidate isn't adequately supported, you won't actually see the retention and down the line, you will remain with like the same numbers that you are at. And obviously there are many other factors that factor in, you know, how you post, where you recruit, but I'll let the rest of the team uh, give their insights on this too. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I think one of the things that I've seen is um, the demand for data professionals is high and the speed to hire. Uh, and, and that means we tend to lean on things that have worked before, which is your network. And um, your network tends to look a lot like you. And so my network looks a lot like me. And so I'm going to hire a lot more of me's. And 
that leads to a, a, not as diverse of a team. And I think um, one of the things that tried to counteract that is when you're not in the rush for hiring and that you need that person today to solve the problem is to build the network on the days that you're not. You know, it's, it's going and reaching out to different um, communities, different networks, getting involved, you know, in different Slack communities and building your network so that the day that you need to hire for it, you have a diverse pool to, to get from because that's been something I've seen, you know, when you need to hire now, you don't have time to go scout and talk to 25 different people um, and you trust who you know. Um, and I'm not saying that that's right, but I've seen that that happens a lot, uh, especially when hiring for these key roles. I'll also say, chime in here, I think some job descriptions that, that tend to lean gatekeepy will keep people from applying, especially women and minorities who studies have shown will not apply to roles unless they meet 100% of the qualifications. So maybe think about, I mean, I really encourage job descriptions that actually post the actual requirements. Like, okay, you have to know SQL, but maybe if your experimentation knowledge isn't you know, up, up to speed, that's also very learnable. Um, there's job descriptions that's like, okay, you must have X amount of years in AB testing or experimentation, or that's just one example. And that keeps, I think, a lot of people out, and that's just one tiny example. But I would really consider uh, job descriptions to actually be a source of uh, people actually self-selecting themselves out of applying and therefore leading to less diversity in the funnel. Um, so something to call out. So I actually just wanted to say, it's actually not a, a tiny problem. It is a big problem. Yeah. And yeah. it is something that I do actually try to um, address with my female friends when they're actually applying for positions. I tell them, you just, you just got to do it. You just got to do it. I, and another study you're talking about, men will apply, they'll have only 60% of the qualifications while we kind of we kind of want that that security that yes i am going to be able to do it and it is something that i personally faced in the past because i also had this expectation where when i was like the only you know woman or the only person of color on a data team there was sort of this like you know like obviously it it was kind of more me that hey i'm representing all these groups so i gotta be a hundred percent right so if I'm applying for a job, like I know I have to go in and I just got to kill it in like day one, which was also like hindering my potential opportunities because I was sort of like capping myself in my safe zone. So I actually had to just like self-reflect and say, hey, you have to go for these other opportunities because I, I know I'm a great learner. I pick up everything and I haven't failed in a job. But even with that, I know that, hey, I'm not going to be, you know, the first a uh, black director on a team and and mess up like that to me like i have those like mental expectations for myself because just because of like the fact that i am a lot of the time the only minority <laughs> or sometimes or just one of few, one of few minorities on a team i feel like the the diversity problem has like a a long history like from grass grassroots upwards where um like the number of um female uh, candidates who've gone into say like stem subjects which was often a gatekeeping requirement on on job descriptions like that that's much lower so like when i went to university the computer science uh year had one female uh, student after out of 160 right so and engineering was better but still nowhere near as good as something much more neutral like maths actually which had more or less 50 50 and then because you what's happened is we've had these kind of requirements on job descriptions which i admit to having done myself at times because i thought oh quantitative role would have a quantitative subject expert right and but because of that you've had you've just narrowed and narrowed the pool and made it much less likely for a female candidate to apply or to enter the field. And I think that's a big problem. And, you know, I feel like we need to address that as a society or societies at schools, like send, send amazing people into schools to speak to, uh, you know, female students.
Yeah, I, I really relate to a lot of what you're all saying. I was a, I was a physics major in college and I was one of three women in a program of about 160. Um, I used to intentionally do my homework in pink pen. So that was the homework that was scanned as the answer key for everyone just to kind of like show off. But um, it was it was challenging. And um, one of the things that I really like about Brooklyn data is when we do our job descriptions, we um, we don't ask for a resume. Um, and so we don't bias towards like, what's your personal network or do you have the right pedigree? We ask a series of questions and we get those answers anonymously. So we also don't know um, the background of the candidate. We're just assessing, you know, do you know um, these skills? Do you know how to do this? What are your thoughts around this? Um, which I really appreciate. And we're very transparent in the job descriptions about um, trying not to, you know, include jargon and also really be true to, to what's in the job description, as well as um, transparently stating what the salary is going to be. Um, Cause that's another issue sometimes is like people aren't very comfortable negotiating a lot of times um, if you are not a, a white man. And so um, it's, it's just all these little things that you have to constantly think about and constantly be really intentional about. It's not, um, if, if anyone out there is struggling with this, it's not like always an obvious answer, um, but it requires like constant assessment and vigilance and iteration to make your process um, better and better. So it, it is a lot of work. Um, if you all are comfortable sharing, um, I would love to hear your thoughts around um, how a lack of diversity negatively impacts um, an individual's data career or and or it's always and <laughs> um, the organization as a whole, both culturally and strategically. I can probably speak to some of that. I don't know about individuals career. I guess it depends on on kind of who you are as an individual. But I think especially in the data roles, our jobs are very hard because we have the technical skills, we have communication skills, we have to, you know, we're customer facing, we're business facing, we're product facing. So there's a lot of different facets to the role. And then if you think about a team, it just gets more and more complex and, and varied. And so I think having different backgrounds on the team, which brings different skills and different points of view, make that multifaceted, you know, kind of interface is a lot better, right? knowing how to talk to different types of people or knowing how to look at different types of problems or knowing how to approach different types of challenges requires a different background. And so in this case, you know, diversity could mean gender and, and ethnicity and race, but it also, could also mean something that a lot of you brought up before too, is like those different backgrounds of like, where did you come from? You know, you were a teacher before and how you maybe explain or teach and train uh, either the team or your customers is probably different than me who I'm, I've never been a teacher. I don't think I could <laughs> ever. Um, and so, you know, I probably wouldn't have the same level of patience, you know? So I think because our jobs are so actually, I think different and our roles are so unique in, in that we do have to have so many different skills as a team, having those backgrounds and experiences and bringing them together so that you can sort of tap into the strong points of, of each person and individual makes us better as a team. And so then I think maybe as a result, the careers of everybody on the team um, are, you know, have a better, better chance of taking off because you can learn from each other too. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a fantastic point. And first, uh, like, I like to say, like, uh, generally, um, to me, like, work is a very social setting. <laughs> it's where we spend, uh, eight hours of a like brain my brain is awake hours so to me i i personally just love uh, a more diverse workplace um to me even just being able to actually meet people and you normally wouldn't meet in your usual social circles and also getting to know them as individuals beyond just like your race your gender your ethnicity i i think is fantastic but and it is also important because on the flip side when uh, you have such a skew in your uh, diversity makeup, it can be a little bit isolating in that. I remember I, I just joined a company, like only a uh, person of color and woman and, you know, everyone else is going to lunch and it's like, well, as soon as I, I know it's like not intentionally like a boys club or like all of them going on the elevator, but it's like, all right, I'm 
I'm maybe going to skip lunch today. And, you know, and it takes a while to kind of connect with um, a very non-diverse social setting. And I'll say in the past, I would have said that I didn't think diversity affected my career and my trajectory. But as I think about it more, um, I do think it did actually have like, it's more just like tiny, like tiny fish, like tiny impacts. And that being one of them, because um, representation matters. And if no one in my, uh, like, in my chain of directors and no one in like a lot of leadership roles look like looks looks like me it does it does impact where i think i'm going to go within that company too and i'm less likely to want to look for companies where hey they're actively looking to diversify their leadership team and uh this is kind of like a bad story i was uh working i was walking with a Korg of mine who's like a six foot white guy and we're passing the executive team and he's like, hey, have you noticed that they're all six foot white men? Like that's gonna be me one day. So obviously to him, <laughs> like that representation matters because it was telling him like, hey, these are the things you can reach. This is, these are the opportunities that are available for you. So yeah, I do think in a way it does, does impact what, how I feel I can move up in a company. I'll jump in here too. Um, I think a lack of diversity is uh, imp impairs your career and the fact that if you are the only woman or person from a non-traditional background or from an underrepresented minority in your team, you may not feel as comfortable sharing your struggles to your manager. And that can, until it's too late, um, because you feel like you have to perform 2x better um, to, because you're representing like all of womanhood or all of the people that have been in boot camps. So like, if you're struggling on a project, you might not actually be honest and say, hey, I'm actually going through this issue. Um, I need some time. Um, instead, you might like internally struggle and beat yourself up. And from the outside, like your manager might think, oh my God, this person's taking a really long time. But internally, you're just struggling because you're, you're too scared to ask for help because you feel like you need to live up to some certain expectation for whatever underrepresented group you're in. Um, and that can really impact you negatively in terms of like work life balance and, you know, just performance in general. Um, so, yeah, if anyone else wants to chime in there, not having that safe space to really be your full authentic self really impacts your career and performance. Yeah, and I would just add on the, the one piece is when I'm acutely aware that I'm the only woman in the room, I'm now focusing on that instead of how to solve the problem. Um, and so that becomes that becomes part of what's messing around in my brain versus we got a problem to solve, we're a team. It's, it's on Julie, the woman data analyst versus Julie, the data analyst. Um, and that sort of identity comes into the problem solving and it, it shouldn't. Yeah, I relate to that so much. I definitely have been in rooms where I've been the only one and I'll be afraid to speak up and I will literally have the thoughts that like people then say two, three, five minutes later, but that I was too afraid to speak up and share myself or a question being like, oh, I'm probably the only one who doesn't know the answer to this. I keep it to myself. And then turns out, you know, the whole room doesn't know the answer to that question. Um, and so I do really agree with both of you that creating those safe spaces um, to learn and to grow, to ask questions um, are really, really important. Um, what external factors do you think um, organizations can do to foster um, diversity and influence um, control for hiring? So one of the things that I did when my team was 100% male at six, and I and I, I wanted to change that, was I, I started to think about, well, you, you can't, we, you know, we wanted to solve, you know, we addressed this, we thought this is a problem, we want to solve it. And one of the things I thought about was, well, if you look at the funnel of candidates coming in, if you passively what we found was when we were passively just, you know, hoping for a diverse candidate pool, we'd still get like 95% male candidates apply. And so what I did was I forced 
the candidates going through to each stage to be 50 50 female uh, female male female and i did that by working with our recruitment team to say look i i know it's not our policy to use agencies but i want to use agencies so look i need more female candidates for this stage of the funnel give get can you get me them and that was that worked really really well i know you know not everyone will have the budget to do that but i think I personally thought that was really worthwhile and it was it worked you know when we had when we had that we we achieved what we wanted i just want to say like uh, kudos to what you did because i noticed earlier like i said the it like the if a manager thinks it is important i actually find the likelihood of finding a diverse candidate increases and also that engagement because um for example, managers that tend to actually even like attend, like, hey, Afrotech happy hour, let's use that, which a lot of them are opportunities for recruitment. The managers that actually engaged and try to come out, I noticed down the line just ended up with more diverse teams when they actually made the effort to really, let me actually engage with these communities, look at unconventional places, go to like, um, what, what do you call them? Oh, go to boot camps. Like, let me actually just try to go into those spaces where you know, hey, this is where the diverse, your diverse candidate pool is going to be at, is going to be talking, going to be comfortable talking to you at. And I just, I just want to say that's, that's, it's amazing that you did that. And, and it, and it's like a, an amazing, like the way it works is really, I don't, I don't know if this is strange or this makes complete sense, but once we had, a team that was more diverse and we and like when i left that team it was 12 people and four were female it's now 50 50 at 15 uh, uh sorry 16 and um it's and i and i even had an anecdote of one like junior analyst who joined the team recently and she said i wouldn't have wanted to join the team if it hadn't been for it being diverse and the fact that it was one of the more diverse technical teams in the company meant I was really attracted to going there. Yeah, we've definitely all scrolled the uh, about us about me page and uh, if you have to do more than one scroll to find someone that looks like you that can be that can be pretty intimidating so I definitely think like it ends up um, multiplying um, once you can kind of see yourself in in the others who already work there. Um, do you all have any experience um, of your team collaborating while um, kind of very acutely paying attention to diversity? Kind of like a little bit has been mentioned, but do the rest of you have any experiences with that? Um, well, I sit on the marketing team. So I do analytics under the marketing team. So I have access to our content team. Um, and that means that when we write job descriptions, I get some really great content writers. Um, and we collaborated on an analyst job description to make it more inclusive. Um, and I have never had so many women reach out to me on Slack saying this job description felt right for me. Um, and so just working with the talent you have within your team and writing a job description that feels inclusive, that feels like somewhere you want to work, got not only great candidates, but also great feedback. Um, and so that was like a tiny little collaboration that every time I think about it, so it was work. It took four times as long to get the job description out the door, but I, I personally feel it was absolutely worth it. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, how do you all think leaders can do a better job of fostering diversity and inclusion internally? I think if, if, if it's, they have to, they have to decide that this is a problem to solve. Cause I just hear a lot of leaders just say, oh, you know, you know, this is a problem, but they kind of blame the funnel or they say, oh, well, it's typical in our industry for it to be, you know, 80, 20 split. And like, and that's kind of their go-to and that's where they leave it. Whereas if they, they actually need to be saying, no, this is a problem. I've joined this company or this company ended up being having a lack of diversity, we're going to come up with actions, spend money to solve it. You know, that 
that if you don't do if you don't line up a problem and tackle it it's it's not going to get solved i've heard that exactly that hey we're kind of doing good for industry standards which aren't great <laughs> to start with yeah i think it's really important to try at least to lead with empathy too because you know i in theory personally i'm could be a diverse candidate because I'm a female, for example, and but you know I haven't I'm not a come from a different country or I don't have different color uh, color of my skin, so like I still don't actually know what that experience could be uh, for everybody else on the team potentially and what experience that they lived through and how they got to the team. So I think trying to at least step into other people's shoes and understand what they're going through and or um, how they might feel or making sure that they have an opportunity to speak you know, to your earlier points about people feeling maybe scared or, or not have the confidence to speak in larger settings because it, it is intimidating. I think as a leader, as a manager, um, being conscious of that and, and giving people opportunity and, and encouraging them and, and kind of celebrating the wins um, and trying to build that confidence up when possible, I think is very important too. So it leads to more inclusive teams because it's also leading by example, right? So if you are like that, the hope is that the rest of the team will kind of pick up on some of that as well. I'm a strong I'm believer strong. that it has to come from the executive level and trickle down or else it won't be as uh, followed. So if, if your C-suite or executives aren't making a priority, it is really hard for that to trickle down into HR and uh, what, whoever is hiring, like all the hiring managers. It'd be great if, you know, a CEO could say like uh, what David just said about, you know, we have to interview 50% and 50% women and men, or, you know, you have to interview at least X amount of people from underrepresented groups. Um, if it's not codified like that, I think it's really hard to follow. Um, because you have to hold yourself up to some expectation and standard. Um, I don't know if anyone else has had that kind of trickle down from the C-suite yet. Open to other thoughts also. Um, we have had that explicitly called out um, that that is a priority for us. And so that's really encouraging and um, we also like open source our hiring process a bit. Uh, and so um, we all get training and take turns um, assessing technical um, take homes and also being on panels. So we also have a different group of people every time talking to candidates and making sure we have a diverse panel that's speaking um, to the candidate in terms of both like what our role is just technically, but also who we are as people and our backgrounds. Um, and like hoping that that also makes the candidate feel a little bit more comfortable throughout the process. Um, I know we're going to get to Q&A in a little bit, but I've noticed in the chat there's a few themes emerging and one of them um, has to do with remote work. And so on the one hand, it seems like remote work has been a great um, playing field leveler in terms of being able to work from anywhere, um, also being safer for folks who may have um, any kind of um, invisible disabilities or disabilities that they don't want to have to disclose to um, their employer. They're, you're able to get your accommodations that you need at home. Um, but we're also seeing sometimes that, you know, a lot of the jobs in this industry are still remote, but US only, um, or remote, but only this region. Um, and so I don't know if all of you are currently at a remote job or not, but maybe you could speak a little to how remote work has been for you um, and how it relates to um, diversity in our space. I, I love remote work, <laughs> so it's been great, but um, even like before COVID, it was my intention to go remote. But uh, one thing I actually will note, uh, will say that remote work actually has a very big impact on diversity because uh, I'm a consultant and I've noticed that my clients that are in uh, more uh, hubs that are more diverse just have 
more diverse, uh, more diverse teams. Like it is what it is. And previously I was actually working with a client that was remote first, and that was actually the first most diverse company I'd ever worked with. So we're talking about, you know, this is what the pipeline looks like. You have to change the pipeline. You have to look at, you know, unconventional ways of bringing in diversity because, you know, the technical recruiter I worked with was a black woman from Michigan. If you're keeping your hiring pool just to the Bay Area, you're going to limit yourself to who lives there if, you, if you're not going to be, if you, if you don't want to accommodate uh, remote candidates and also international because, you know, it's very different from 10 years ago where it might have been hard to work remotely, but now um, it's, it's easy in my opinion. I do think that I agree with you that the remote remote works an opportunity to work remotely helps in a lot of cases. I do think that it does make the kind of personal connections at work more challenging. So in my ideal world, and I don't think, I don't know if anybody's actually figured it out, maybe they have, if there was an opportunity to have those events or get togethers or some way to connect so you know who these people are, like we were talking about earlier, learning who you are as a person, not just, you know, oh, you can do your job really well. Uh, which usually happens when you're in the office and you, you know, bump into each other at the favorite snack that you maybe, you know, the last one left in the kitchen and you want to grab it or whatever that might be. Like those connections are really hard to recreate. Um, and, and I do think it's important again for us to like understand where people are coming from. Having those personal connections is important. Um, but having said that, I think the, the flexibility that it allows you to have and, 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 and the fact that it is really kind of allows you to show up at work in the way that, that is comfortable for you much more so than coming into the office is a huge benefit. So it's, it's been, for me personally, it's been challenging. Like I love it and I, you know, I have kids, so then I have other demands on my time that make scheduling and, and commuting to work very challenging. Um, and so there are a lot of parts about it that I really appreciate that I can stay home and, you know, if my kid is sick, I can go pick him up. But I started at my company during the pandemic. So I was remote and, you know, I didn't meet anybody for the first year and a half and it was hard. Um, I, I was so excited to see people in person. I think I hugged some people that I've never seen before and it was, I don't know if they appreciated it, but I was really excited. So I think that personal connection is important and that's how we make a lot of friends right through our career. And, and it's a lot harder to do it over Zoom and Slack. So that's my only kind of like, I wish we could figure out what that happy medium could be so you could, you could have that. Um, but I agree, I think it is um, a lot easier for people to be successful and, and manage their lives. So I, I, before COVID, I, I'd never work remotely. I'd always be working in London full time and commuting in and therefore basically not being around during the week. And um, now I, I've worked remotely, obviously, during COVID. And now I work remotely for a US company where most people are in Boston, but are spread out around the country. And what I found is that it's it's enabled me to do more things like childcare um, and just being around more so that it's actually enabled my wife to do like her meetings and be take a step forward in what she wants to do outside of our home and that's something I think I hope happens more and I think you know society and government kind of takes advantage of free care that women provide in a lot and hopefully remote enables women, not only women to do more with the flexibility, but allows their partners who are often male to, to help them to facilitate what they want to do. Completely. Thank you for your thoughts on that. Um, we're at the Q and A portion of our panel. Um, and so um, I'll try to get through as many of these as I can. Um, but we'll also have some follow up in Slack afterwards if there's any we don't get to. Um, our panelists have uh, graciously agreed to reply to any of those questions. Um, another theme that we're seeing here is um, kind of the necessary requirements um, to to get a job in this industry, and whether we think you know is it that um, 
people aren't able to access that education or higher education to even put them into the candidate pool, or is it a lack of, or is it um, a lack of openness and explicit discrimination that's stopping people from getting into um, the workforce? I saw in the chat some people are discussing. You know, there's a lot of diversity for like senior roles, but what about those junior roles or someone just starting out? Um, how how do we level that playing field? And like, what do we think that the core the core issue is there? I know there's a lot there to unpack, but um, any of your thoughts on that would be great. So um, I could take a piece of that because there is a lot there. Um, I've done some mentoring with uh, people looking to get into the data space, whether they're already in tech and they're just looking to transition over or they're coming out of school. And the most common thing is this feeling of it being this um, almost like a PhD statistician, like you're this crazy scientist. And so for me, a lot of it is just really breaking down that there's a really clear path, simple, all of it's accessible online. I'm self-taught. I say that after having mentors help me, but I don't have a formal education um, in any data. I started in marketing and just sort of learned as I went. Um, so I think where we're at now, you can learn it all online. Um, and I think it's, it's understanding that um, it's not this crazy PhD statistician data scientist world. There's so many, there's so many roles in data that require very little technical skills and as you start learning you can build um, and you can add pieces to your puzzle and you can become a little bit more technical every day every year um, so i think that's it's that impression of it being harder and this bigger mountain to climb than it truly is Thanks. I would really, really oh go ahead. Sorry, I was gonna say I really agree with that point too. And I think it goes back to an earlier point that somebody made about how um, you know, women especially have the expectation that if they see a job description, they have to hit every point and, and then they don't even apply because they don't think they're qualified. There's that that impression that these jobs are so technical and so involved. And they are in some cases, and you do have to um um, uh, you know. At, at some point, probably learn some of those skills, but a lot of them you can learn on the job. And, and, and a lot of what we discuss when we are interviewing and hiring people is, yes, there's some foundational skills we would you know, need you to have, like SQL is important to do an analytics and analyst job. But what we're really looking for is people who can figure it out. I'm not really interested in uh, having somebody hit every answer because they've done that before, because the next question that's going to come at work is probably not going to be something that they've done before. So if they can't figure it out, they don't know how to ask the right questions. If they, uh, you know, can Google whatever <laughs> answer they need to look for, they probably actually not going to be as successful in this role than somebody who maybe like, you know, didn't hit every technical aspect, but is so curious and hungry and excited and, you know, is open to getting that help and asking for help and, 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 and kind of shows that during the interview to us that that would be much more likely somebody who would succeed and really have a great future. So I think, and it's really hard to interview for that, to be honest, like we're constantly, you know, iterating as how we talk to people and making sure that we're, you know, looking for the right signals, but that is actually uh, a lot more important to be successful. So I think that fear of what could be versus being honest about what you have or what you're excited and what you can, you think you can bring to the table is, is so much more important. Thanks. Um, I definitely think that, um, you know, we can't, we can't say like, oh, you don't need any technical experience. You know, this is a tech space. Um, but I think what you're saying about those signals um, are so important because I think a lot of the quote unquote, like soft skills I have are what serves me the best in my day to day technical role um, and what really differentiates me from other people. And so I think that, um, getting that signal on not just the technical skills, also so important in getting um, different people and uh, helpful people with inside your org. Um, this is a very uh, direct question. Do you have any examples um, that you could share of job descriptions maybe after this in the, in the Slack? Would that be okay? Um, that you're like proud of from your org or other ones that you've seen? Um, I will try and dig up the one that got got the praise. Um, 
I've been looking for it, to be honest. But uh, once I find it, I will, I will share it. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Um, this is maybe a little philosophical, but um, maybe we can try to make it tangible. Is the lack of diversity a function of discrimination or a lack of qualified candidates in diverse populations or both? Um, and how do you how do you get to the heart of that? And that question's from Dinesh, so thank you. I think I think there's that question of that word qualified. What does qualified mean? Like it's that thing that I mentioned before. So oh well, we need someone who has a STEM degree. Well, why do you really need that? And and then when you start removing some of those gatekeeping elements of qualified, you can unlock that population. Um, I think there's probably I I I I hopefully say that there isn't a lot of overt oh we don't want women in this team i hope there's not but i think there's a lot of subconscious hiring people that are like you and have the same interests as you and that's how you and you can end up in in that that space quite easily if you're not careful it's also it can be a subject of resources and set in their ways hr practices like for example if a company always recruits from the same top five universities and doesn't give access to HBCUs or universities that are not in California, New York, and I don't know, Illinois. Like it's hard to it, it, there. It's going to be harder to get those diverse candidates that you see that you want on your team. Um, I see lots of teams. Yeah, I'm glad. Like. A lot of folks from Berkeley or UIUC, and it's 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 because there's you know a lack of HR resources to do a lot more than that. We're getting better at it, but um, there needs to be extra effort from HR programs to really find those hidden gems outside of what they're used to recruiting at, especially young talent. Yeah, I I completely agree with that because yeah. I actually I saw that one company specifically hired chemical mechanical engineers from a subset of top schools and I um because actually I I kept wondering why why I actually never even saw like a lot of black women go because I sat I sat next to one of the interview rooms I'm like I never see black women go into this interview room and. I looked at the data and I remember I was like one of only 116 black women who graduated chemical engineering in the year I did. And at Carnegie Mellon, I was just like, I think one or two in my entire class. So Samuel was actually really the start of me, uh, of me kind of seeing, of having to like uh, work and study in a really non-diverse environment. So if you really want to get that specific, then this is what you're going to get <laughs> because the numbers don't match, uh, don't align with your strategy. Thank you so much. The next question we have is from Seb and they're wondering if you could share any advice. Uh, what can someone do if the company they work at doesn't value gender, ethnicity, racial diversity and sees it as a non-issue during hiring? All right, but I'm, I'm going to be honest. And leave. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I was going to say, but leave. with your yeah. yeah, leave. Yeah, that's an awful No, I, I leave. And, and I love I love helping my friends find roles. I'm constantly referring. I refer people to companies. I've already left. And I'm not going to be getting that referral bonus from. But I'm not going to refer you if I feel that you're not going to be supported. Because as I mentioned before, retention is also a very key part to that hiring once you get them in they have to be supported they have to feel like they are going to be successful in that role but because there's honestly so much influence you have over your uh, over the hiring manager over hr so no i'm out <laughs> Yeah, I think there's some consensus there. I'm sorry if that was not the answer you were hoping for, um, but it is it is hard to you know make that change if you're not in a position of power kind of within the within the company. Um, it was mentioned a couple of times that execs have to be willing to spend money to foster diversity. 
Um, this question is from JC. Um, what kinds of expenses come with having a diverse workplace? They say it feels like it should be free, but in terms of both the hiring and retention, uh, what what kind of costs are associated with that? I think I think that was kind of partly me, wasn't it? So I think when you start in a bad place, there's inertia to overcome. And to overcome that inertia, you need to put some force in, and that will include probably some money. But like I said, once you get past that, it starts to kind of gain its own momentum and you don't need to do that as much. Um, I, I There is also the point that, you know, with that team that now is 50-50, you know, part of me worries, have I just made the rest of the, of the industry less diverse, right? Does it, is it a zero sum game? And it's not, right? And there's things we can do to make it less so. Like we can, there should be more programs to get people outside of tech, especially from underrepresented background into tech. Um, you know, there's, I almost feel like that there's nothing, say for women who like, who are returning to work, there's almost nothing for, for them available to get into tech. And there's just such a huge population there that we could support. Yeah, um, actually, I wholly agree. Returnships, actually, you know, a company that focused on that. And uh, at the end of it, it went from all of us being like single engineers to, wow, we actually have like mothers and fathers uh, working on the team. And it's not a bunch of people in their 20s. It's like uh, just even age. I feel like age, that is another form of discrimination. You have like uh, a varied uh, age uh, age group. And just kind of going back to expi explicit expenses, um, companies I've worked for have invested in doing happy hours in communities that will draw women in. They're like, if you tell me that, hey, we're going to do a uh, women in tech or data happy hour, I get all my friends to join. They'll come in and you'll actually hire for roles that just want data. But like I had a designer like, hey, I was I came in, came to the happy hour, talked to the team. I'm interested in applying for a design position. And also, um, I also believe mentorship is key. So if you actually are hiring uh, you know, like more minorities and more a more diverse team and the, you're putting them in a new role. Once again, I feel like it is important that they are supported. So while they might not have a, a viable mentor within the company paying for, uh, I think, Plato, there are uh, these other uh, outside companies that will provide them the mentorship they need to be successful. So to me, those are just some like actual practical expenses you would need to invest in for your employers, for your employees to get them hired and also retained and happy. Um, I think we just have time for one more question, um, but the rest of the questions again will be answered in Slack. Um, do y'all have any examples of the kinds of questions you would ask in an interview for the candidate to demonstrate how they problem solve or learn or think? if a lot of the skill set is learnable and not required? Sometimes it's not about the specific questions. One of the things I look for is if the candidate is asking a lot of questions and if they're, you know, genuinely seem to be uh, based on our conversation or based on like follow up on something maybe that I asked, because that shows me that they are paying attention, that curiosity that you know, I think a lot of very successful data professionals have that innate curiosity that gets them to dig through data in the future or, or get to the better answer for the analysis or what have you. Um, and so if it's not like the pre-baked, you know, somebody downloaded 10 questions they have to ask and they kind of ask those questions in every interview, if I can tell that these are genuinely coming from, from these candidates themselves, that's very important. And I think the other ones are, it's just that, you know, there's still maybe analytics questions where we do maybe ask about, uh, you know, how would you visualize X, Y, and Z, for example, but more open-ended just to see how people think through the problem. We're not always looking for the right answer. Sometimes there is no right answer. There's multiple ways of solving or visualizing, uh, you know, solving a problem or visualizing a data set. It's more about how do you think through the problem? Again, are you asking questions along the way? Because that hopefully gives me a window into how you work. I want to work with people who work with me and 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 collaborate and ask questions and 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 are partners in thinking through problems and that's what I'm really looking for when I interview. So it's not even that it's a specific question that I ask. 
It's more how does that interaction go and completely understand that it's really hard, especially if you're early in your career and it's really scary to interview. So it's really hard to open up. So as somebody on the other side of it, I try to, you know, crack some jokes and <laughs> try to make it as casual of an experience as possible to hopefully draw some of it out and pay attention to the clues and, and try to understand if sometimes you can tell that people are so stressed and nervous that they're not kind of opening up more. So being really, really intentional about it is important too. I think like, especially for like entry level roles and you're not expecting them to even know, maybe they don't even, you're not expecting them to know SQL or anything. Like you can, you can ask things that, you know, show someone's aptitude to think in a certain way. So you can ask them things like reasoning or logic questions. You can ask them like the elements of maths that you do need for the role. Um, and then I think uh, uh, you've got to, I think what I realized is when you're hiring at that level, what you, the, mo the majority of what you're looking for is like a, like a, a cultural fit and, a, and a, a way of thinking and a way of being open and being able to learn. And that that's kind of what you're looking for more than hard things they've done because they haven't done very much, and that's that's fine for someone at that level. Uh, well, thank you all. Thank you all for sharing your experiences. I'm going to kick it to Ali uh, first. And close us out. Right on time. Great transition. Um, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Julia, Megan, David, Christine, Julie, and Jessica. I got everybody. We had a great panel today, and I really appreciate all of you taking the time and the space to participate and share about your experiences. Um, yeah, it was it was great. I learned a lot. We had a lot of really good conversation in the chat, so I really appreciate uh, y'all taking the time. Um, and we have about 10 unanswered questions, uh, so we'll roll those over into the Operational Analytics Club for folks to answer. Um, and we'll also share a couple resources and other communities that you can join, including the ones that our lovely panelists uh, mentioned today. So. Uh, again, thank you, and we will see you again in a couple of minutes for the continued sessions for track one. Um, and if you want to check out our actionable advice tracks or our technical talks for today, uh, you can find those in the upper left-hand corner. Um, but yeah, thanks again, everybody, and we will see you shortly.